ya. Things are gonna get easier. Thank you. Jack Russell, um, lead vocalist, Jack Russell's Great White. We had um, met this guy, his name was Alan Niven, and um, through a friend of mine, Don Dawkin, right? He brought him down to the, to the whiskey one night to see us. And um, he liked the band, you know what I mean? So he was, uh, he had starred this record company called Enigma through Green World. And, you know, he had done like Berlin and Motley originally, right? And um, so he wanted to sign us. So he brought me, he had Mark and I come down to a meeting at the label and it was on Gramercy, I remember down in uh, Torrance. And uh, I remember going in and, and I swear the chairs we were in were like four inches lower than his because he's like, you know, somehow he's looking down on us. So we're going like, uh, you know, we're all scared. And he's all, okay, you know, I, I really love the band. I want to do a deal with you guys. But he goes, uh, what would you think about changing the name? And we were called Dante Fox at that time. We're going like, change the name? We'll lose all our following, like 500 people, you know? And um, so we're like, we're like well, what, would, what would you want to change it to? And he goes, how about Great White? And I'm like, what? I mean, I was way into sharks. I'm shark fishing, you know, I lived on a boat. I mean, still do, you know, love fishing for sharks. I'm fascinated by them my whole life. Um, and I used to call Mark the Great White because he was really white. I mean, the guy is like, you know, he looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know what I mean? Or the guy in the Quaker oatmeal box. I mean, he had the hat, you know? So I, I used to call Mark Handel the Great White on lead guitar. And so he heard me say that and he goes, oh, well, how about Great White? And we're like, oh, that's stupid, Great White. But like, you know, what if it's going to get us a record deal? Okay, you can call us the buzz. We don't care, you know? So we agreed to it. And um, I remember we had, we were supposed to meet with him in uh, this little, his house in Palos Verdes. It was a little shack, not a shack, a little cottage he was living in. And um, we went over there one night and <clears throat> the whole band's there and we met with him. He goes, Jack, he goes, I'm really sorry. I go, what? He goes, I got some bad news. I go, what? He goes, well, I, I, uh, I quit my job today. I go, what? He goes, well, he goes, the, 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 my partners didn't want to sign you. The Hind brothers, they were the ones that, you know, own Green World. And he goes, they didn't, they didn't want to sign you. And uh, so I told him to screw off, piss off. And you know what I mean? I quit. He goes, I don't know what I'm gonna do now. I go, yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna do now either. I go, well, why don't you be our manager? He goes, I don't know a thing about managing. I go, well, you'll learn. He goes, all right, let's do it. So, you know, within a couple of months, he had round raised enough money to take us in the studio with Don Dockett and Michael Wagner and produce our first EP on our own label. And we released it, and, and I remember one day we were down in Huntington Beach at this garage where we used to practice at a friend's house. And we're all standing out front having a break, and he pulls up and he puts down this little uh, ghetto blaster, you know what I mean? And turns it on, it was on uh, KMET, you know, which was one of the main stations in Los Angeles. And he goes, just wait a minute, wait a minute. And we're like, oh, probably some advertisement for a show. And all of a sudden, out of the night comes on the radio, and we're going like, okay, I'm waiting for it to cut in. No, oh, Great Wyatt at the whiskey or something. And it just keeps going. And we're looking at each other, we're going, oh my God, we're on the radio. You know what I mean? We couldn't believe it. And we're laughing, just high-fiving and hugging. And, and somehow he'd managed to convince KMET to add our band in its rotation. We were the first band ever. To, to not be on a major label that was in, in regular rotation on a major radio station. That had never happened before, not Motley, anybody. So it was like a total coup. And um, we ended up selling like 10,000 records or 20,000 records uh, on our own in LA. And every label in town wanted to sign us. Every label in town. And um, we went out to lunch and dinners with everybody, you know what I mean? Oh, we're out to win, oh yeah, you know, we're, we're gonna pull together like a team, you know what I mean? I'm going, this is Have a Cigar, you know, Pink Floyd. And um, 
So it, it was really interesting. We ended up signing with this label called EMI America, who I had never heard of, unbelievably. And um, this guy named Gary Gersh, he signed this. And I didn't like the guys. It was just kind of icky to me, you know what I mean? And um, so we're out on the road with Judas Priest. We get the biggest tour of the year, you know, Defenders of the Faith, sold out arenas, the whole tour we got, not just part of it. They give us the whole tour. And um, I walk across the street one time to this record store right across from the arena. And I'm like, hey, where's the Great White album? And he goes, who? I go, Great White. He goes, I never heard of him. I go, dude, we're playing the arena tonight with Judas Priest. He goes, I'm sorry, I've never heard of you guys. I'm like, this is not good. So I call my manager, I go, something's going on here. Our record's not in the store, blah, blah, blah. So we find out that um, Rupert Perry was the president of the company and Gary Gersh was the vice president. And he wanted to have the president's job. So what does he do? He signs the hottest band in town, you know what I mean, at the time and he buries us. So what happened is we eventually left the label, you know, after we sold like 100,000 copies. And um, we ended up, you know, saying, screw you. He gets the president's job, of course. And, you know, we're out in the cold. And, you know, if you, if you know anything about the politics of record labels, after you've been kicked off a label or left the label, you're like blackballed. You know, nobody wants anything to do with you. It's like, oh, this, no way. And somehow, we managed to get a guy named Ray Tuscan from Capital, EMI's sister company, to sign the band, you know, and because we put out our own record again, and there's a song called Face a Day on it. That was the number two song of the year on uh, KLOS, the other station in Los Angeles. And it was a huge success. And then they re released that, it did okay. Then we did the One Spitting Album, and the rest is history. You know? Everybody knew who you were. It was like, wow, you know what I mean? Everywhere you go, be like, oh my God, yeah, you know, freaking out. Um, playing, sold out tour with Whitesnake, you know, again, the whole tour we, we ended up doing. And, and, um, and every arena was sold out. I mean, you know, 20,000 seats every night, you know, a 10,000 seat place was like small gig. You know what I mean? It was just so unbelievable and it, I can't even describe what an incredible rush it is. I mean, we were, I remember being in LA and it was April 6, 1988, and we were playing the forum the next night. And I mean, I remember that was where I saw my first concert. It was Bush or Cult. And I remember sitting with my friends when I was like 13, going, geez, when he says I'm be on that stage, and they're going, yeah, right. You know, keep smoking it, you know what I mean? I'm like, oh, I'm really gonna know I'm gonna be there, you know? And then I opened up the curtain in my window and there it was across the parking lot it was the forum all lit up and I'm like, wow, I'm playing there tomorrow night. It's sold out. 